In May 1928, Lawrence heard that Ottolin was ill with bone cancer. By then, he was dying himself from tuberculosis, and he tried to say sorry. In a letter to her, he said, You've influenced lots of lives, as you have influenced mine, through being fundamentally generous and through being Ottolin. There's only one Ottolin. And he called her a queen among the mass of women. But the miner's son and the lady never saw one another again. The high culture revolutionaries didn't really catch on at the time. Most people preferred modern crime fiction, silent films, and the most exciting new technology of the day. One evening in June 1920, a crowd was gathering outside the Marconi Works in Chelmsford, Essex, waiting breathlessly for the Australian-born opera singer Dame Nellie Melba. Dame Nellie Melba was the most famous singer in the world. She was huge. Melba Toast, Peach Melba, both named after her. She arrived here in Essex for Britain's first ever radio event. When she got to the rather primitive studio, one of the engineers explained to her that her singing was going to be transmitted from a 450-foot high tower just outside. Young man, she said, if you think I'm going to climb up there, you are greatly mistaken. At ten past seven, accompanied by a small grand piano, Dame Nelly directed her voice into the microphone. The 30-minute concert, sung in English, French and Italian, began with Home Sweet Home and ended with a single verse of God Save the King. The world's first international broadcast performance was picked up by radio pioneers all the way from Chelmsford to Paris, Madrid, Berlin, even Newfoundland. The next day, the papers reported that the songs came over mellow and perfect without scratch or jar. Radio One, late night talk shows, Terry Wogan. This is where it all began. Christmas 1918, Lincoln Prison. An Irish prisoner is serving at mass. Choosing his moment, he takes the priest's key from the vestry and makes an impression in candle wax. One February night, the prisoner used his copied key and walked free from the building. And then he escaped through a hole in the fence which had been cut for him by an accomplice from the outside. The prisoner was Eamon de Valera, the sharp-faced leader of Sinn Féin, soon to be Ireland's first president. And his accomplice with the wire cutters was Michael Collins, a Republican hero known as the Big Fella. That night, they were working together. Soon, they would be mortal enemies as a bloody civil war turned Green Ireland red. In January 1919, Sinn Féin declared Ireland's independence 
and formed its own parliament, the Doyle. This was an assault on the empire as well as the United Kingdom. Michael Collins set up an elite team of IRA assassins known as the Twelve Apostles. They efficiently targeted British troops and collaborators. The British responded with an MI5 trained team of British agents known as the Cairo Gang. In November 1919, Collins set out to destroy them. At eight one Sunday morning, the 12 apostles burst into eight houses and shot 14 British agents dead. One was killed in his pajamas trying to escape through the back garden. Some were shot in bed, some in front of their wives. Now the violence spread in all directions. Sinn Féin and the Doyle were outlawed and British forces stormed through Ireland. After 18 months of terror, Eamon de Valera and Lloyd George agreed to a truce. Talks began in October 1921. De Valera stayed at home and ordered Collins to join the Irish delegation in London. If he came back with less than Sinn Féin's full demands, Collins knew he'd be the scapegoat. As the negotiations began, he said to a fellow Republican, you might say, the trap is sprung. The talks moved towards a compromise, with Ireland self-governing but still inside the British Empire, and with the six predominantly Protestant northern counties free to choose to remain within the United Kingdom. After nearly two months, the Irish delegation was still agonizing over the deal. With a theatrical flourish, Lloyd George arrived brandishing two envelopes. One contained the agreement, the other the refusal to come to terms. If I send this letter, he said, it's war, and war within three days. Will you give peace or war to your country? We must have your answer by 10 p.m. tonight. One by one, the Irish representatives signed the agreement. Michael Collins believed he was giving Ireland something it had wanted for 700 years. But that night, in his lodgings, he wrote, early this morning, I signed my death warrant. Back in Dublin, the treaty was narrowly voted through in the Doyle, but Eamon de Valera denounced it as a betrayal and resigned. Collins and de Valera were now enemies in a cruel civil war dividing Republican families and friends. In August 1922, Michael Collins, now chief of the Irish National Army, went on a tour of his home county, Cork. Collins stopped at this pub to ask a local for directions, little realising that the man was an anti-treaty rebel whose gun was leaning against a wall just inside the bar. That evening, Collins came back along the same road. A rebel ambush was waiting. They'd been here for hours, and some of them had given up and gone back to the pub, but not all. At 8 o'clock, the convoy came round the corner. 